Thanks, Glenn. Good morning again. Welcome. It's good to see everybody today. Last week, we started this little short sermon series on the book of Jonah called Persistent Grace. The outreach team here at Severna Park chose this book because our charge, our charter, is to help the church become more and more focused on reaching those who don't know Christ, reaching into our community with the gospel and the good news of God's grace. We've got a lot of events, as Glenn announced, made, made reference to in our announcement sheet coming up, opportunities to be involved in outreach, like Touch a Truck and the uh, Damascus Road Concert, Free Family Flea, lots of corporate events, but this study is more than just that. It's to try to help us in our day-to-day -day walk to understand God's calling and our reluctance to follow him and what that's going to look like when he continues to persistently pursue us with his grace. Last week, we saw how God called Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach against this big city, but Jonah didn't want anything to do with Nineveh. So Jonah decides he's going to hop on a ship going in the opposite direction because Jonah had a faulty understanding of God on a number of levels. This week we catch up with Jonah, having left the port of Joppa on his way to Tarshish. And we pick up our reading this morning at chapter 1 and verse 4. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God. And they threw the cargo in the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck where he lay down and he fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he'll take notice of us and we'll not perish. And the sailors said to each other, come and let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I'm a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. This terrified them, and they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he'd already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher. So they asked him, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it's my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they couldn't, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried to the Lord, O oh Lord, please don't let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, O oh Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and they threw him overboard. And the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice to the Lord. And they made vows to him. The grass withers and the flowers fall. But the words of our Lord stand forever. Father in heaven, we come this morning asking you to show us something fresh about your grace through Jonah's life. Something new in how persistent you pers persistently you pursued Jonah and how you persistently pursue us. Oh Lord, we want to be a people who are encouraged and challenged and helped to love you well and to love those around us well, for Christ's sake. And we ask these things in his strong name. Amen. I know it won't come as a surprise to most of you to know that I got in a lot of trouble when I was a kid. I was a preacher's kid, meanest kid in town, they said. Share a story with you. It happened to me when I was about 13 years old. Me and two of my buddies had this great idea that one Halloween night, we were going to get a bunch of eggs, and we were going to go up in the bell tower of the church where my daddy pastored, and we were going to throw eggs at cars. Seemed like a great idea at the time, I'm telling you, for a 13-year-old. We got our eggs. It got dark. Me and my buddies headed up the bell tower, the stairs, that bell tower. We went up in the, in the top of that thing. It was like on top of the world. 
we started throwing eggs. We hit every car that came down that street. We had a big time. We didn't have enough eggs to stay up there very long. We run out of eggs pretty quickly. We knew we had to get out of that church really quickly. So we ran back down and went out a window that I had left unlocked a few days earlier so we could come into the church and nobody would know it. My two buddies went through that window really quick. They disappeared into the night. And I was right behind them, headed out the window, and I was thinking as I was crawling through that window, we pulled it off. We got away with it, right? Well, now me being the conscientious kid that I was at 13, I wanted to make sure that the window was shut because we didn't want people going into the church who shouldn't be in there, right? <laughs> so I closed the window, turn around, get ready to run. Two policemen standing right in front of me with their flashlights shining right in my face. You ever had a situation in your life that you thought you got away with it? You pulled something off only to have it come back and bite you. I'm pretty sure that's how Jonah felt that day as that ship sailed out of Joppa and began its journey to Tarshish. But God wasn't through with Jonah by any stretch. And he stirs up this violent storm that threatened to sink the ship. Now, the storm was God's means. His ends or his goal was and is to make himself known, to change his people, and to reach the lost. And he is intentional about it. As we prepare our hearts and our minds to come to that table this morning, I want us to th think about those three things for just a little bit. First, God is intentional in making himself known. Jonah's asleep in the hold of the ship. But up on the deck, God is making himself known to the crew through a hurricane. Now, these men were seasoned sailors. This storm was different and they knew it because they felt the ship was coming apart. Really, the sailors were dealing with two storms. They were dealing with a storm on the sea, and they were dealing with a storm in their hearts. And the Bible tells us they were afraid, and each of them began to pray. Now, we don't know how religious any of these guys are, but I'm pretty sure they sensed this storm was supernatural, and they were going to need some supernatural help. Then in an effort to save the ship, they start lightening its load and throwing stuff overboard next we see the captain get involved the captain says I'm going to go down and speak to this guy so he goes down he confronts Jonah and he rebukes him how can you sleep he says get up and pray like we're doing maybe your God will come and help us and we won't die here that didn't help so the sailors once again they decide we need to get to the bottom of this so they begin to cast lots kind of like throwing dice figure out who the problem is and of course the lot fell on Jonah, and they go and confront him again. They start asking him questions. Who's responsible for this trouble? What do you do? Where do you come from? What's your country? They start peppering Jonah with questions. Now, I'm pretty sure at this point, the crew of that ship didn't know who God really was. The storm was saying something very real about God, but Jonah was going to make it very clear to them. And Jonah says, I'm a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. Everyone in the ancient Near East had heard of the Hebrews, and had heard of this God who delivered them from Egypt, who had heard of all these things that was going on, this supernatural, all-powerful God. And so when Jonah acknowledges that he's a Hebrew, it's an expression that God is no distant, impersonal God as the sailors understood, but he's a relational God who's made himself known to a particular people. And Jonah adds that he worships this Lord. The word for worship here is also translated fear. I fear the Lord. It's not this fear of a sense that God is getting ready to drop a hammer on you. It's, it's this kind of sense of the awesomeness and reverence of God because he is the creator he's the one that made the land and the sea he's the one that controls this storm and everything else and because that's true he is worthy of all worship you see God is intentional in making himself known not as one God of many gods but as the one true and living God the only one 
One of my neighbors calls himself a cafeteria Catholic, which is really indicative of the spiritual culture in which we live, where folks pick and choose gods of their own desire, gods of their own liking, kind of like a religious buffet out there these days. And it's really easy to understand why people do this, because these gods neither confront nor condemn These gods say, call me when you have time. These gods say, hey, everybody makes mistakes. Just try a little better next time. For these gods, forgiveness is an obligation because they're too loving to punish sin. And it really doesn't matter which of these paths you choose because they all lead to the same God. But honestly, as I think about this, if each of us can pick our own God How can we have any more confidence in that God than we have in ourselves? And if all paths lead to the same God, how could I ever have hope in a God who is so inconsistent and illogical? These gods have neither the power to save nor the power to help, just as the gods to which the sailors cried out. But on the other hand, the one true and living God, as he has made himself known in his word, he's consistent, he's logical, he is powerful. All of which we see in creation, that's what we've been talking about in Romans chapter 1 in that study. He's made himself known in creation, in this case through the storm, but even more importantly, how he has made himself known in the person and work of Jesus Christ. God has not left himself without a witness. I want to ask you the most important question that you're going to ever be faced with in your life. Do you know the one true and living God as he has made himself known in his word and through his living word, his son, Jesus Christ? Do you know him? Do you know him? Are you still picking and choosing gods in your own image, gods of your own desire, gods of your own liking? You need to be very, very careful. Make sure the God you choose is able to save you. Any God created in our own image does not have the ability to save you. But this one does. God has made himself known in the person and work of Jesus Christ, and he can save you. And the cross and the empty tomb demonstrate conclusively that Christ is able to save. God is intentional in making himself known. But he's also intentional in changing his people. Now, in order for God to change Jonah, he has to first expose his hypocrisy. I want you to think about Jonah for a minute. From the moment Jonah got on that ship, his life was completely inconsistent with what he said and knew about God. He went below to avoid the sailors because he didn't want anything to do with them either. Hypocrisy is a, it's bad. It's a horrible thing when it rises up in our lives. But very often, God will use hypocrisy to expose our weaknesses and our inconsistencies and show us our constant need for repentance and faith. So the question is, how consistent are we in our Christian walk? See, in the very same way that these sailors challenge Jonah, very often God will use the world around us to challenge us to consistently live as witnesses to Christ, what he is, who he is, and what he's done for us. I'm convinced that very few people in the world would have a problem with Christianity if we love like Christ loves. Too often we don't do that, though, do we? This week I saw someone wearing a T-shirt that said this, I got nothing against God. It's his fan club I can't stand. Now, when I first saw that, I was incredibly resentful. I thought, this person doesn't have a clue about who God is or his church. Then instead of being resentful, it hit me shortly 
I kind of resemble that a lot of times in my own life. If we profess to be Christians, our walk of faith must be consistent with our words of faith or else we push folks away from Christ. Now, God's in the business of changing his people and he's going to change Jonah. Now, we're going to see this is going to be very short-lived for Jonah, but at this point, Jonah gets something and we see it in verse 12. I know that it's my fault that this storm has come upon you. Jonah confesses that he is the problem. You see, humility is the first change that God is always after in his people, and he is intentional about getting it. He'll often use the storms in our lives until we too acknowledge, I'm the problem, not someone else, not something else, it's me. And you know what? Humility always gets God's attention. But God's intentional about changing us in another way as well, that our humility leads us to faith. Jonah has faith that God will show mercy and he will stop the storm, which is exactly what he does as soon as he gets tossed overboard. Now, while Jonah, I believe, was sincere in humbling himself and expressing his faith here, he still had to suffer the consequences of his sin. We're going to see this next week when Glenn Pack takes up, this pas- takes up the next passage in Jonah, that God had to teach Jonah through his own personal experience that the wages of sin really is death, and there's absolutely nothing Jonah can do about it. Then and only then would Jonah really be able to grasp and understand God's grace. You see, humility leading to faith is the place we have to start, but that's not the end. We end looking for God to do something for us that we can't do for ourselves. That's the gospel in a nutshell, and that's exactly why Christ had to come and why Jesus had to die for us. You see, it's an act of faith to accept God's interpretation of our lives that we're sinners and he has every right to judge us. It is an act of faith to humble ourselves and submit to his holiness and to his justice. But it is the fruit of faith. It is the fruit of that faith that sees and believes and receives God's grace in the Lord Jesus Christ who came to do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. And because that's true, Christ is our only hope. He is our only hope. God is intent on making himself known and changing his people. But last, he's intent on reaching the lost. Now, we don't know much about the sailors, but they seem like decent men. I mean, no question they wanted to save their own skin, but they didn't want to kill Jonah to do it. I mean, the Bible says they tried their best to row the ship back to the land, but it wasn't going to work. They just didn't want to kill Jonah. Now, I want you to contrast that with Jonah's actions. You see, for him, the sailors were like the Ninevites, people he didn't want anything to do with. But instead of looking down on them, Jonah should have felt a common bond with them. They were all flesh and blood. They were all perishing, and they all needed rescue. You see, these men for whom Jonah seemed to care so little were showing a genuine measure of care for him, and in that, they were a whole lot closer to God's character and his heart than Jonah was. What's really ironic here is Jonah was running from God because he didn't want to carry God's message to the lost. So God puts Jonah on a ship full of lost people. The very thing Jonah was trying to avoid in Nineveh was happening right before his eyes. But now the sailors have a dilemma. Jonah's God is awesome, and he is powerful, the likes of which these guys have never seen. And if he causes a hurricane to get the attention of one of his wayward children, oh my, he's someone to be reckoned with. 
And so they have no other hope. And so with great fear and reservation, they begin to pray. They ask the Lord to don't hold them accountable for taking an innocent man's life. And they throw Jonah overboard. And look at what happens. The raging sea grew calm. Verse 16, at this the men greatly feared the Lord and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. That word feared the Lord is the same word used earlier in worship the Lord. I believe these men were converted. You see, Jonah's unfaithfulness was no stumbling block to God's faithfulness because God is intent on reaching the lost. Ari White, the no Scottish theologian, he was the principal of the Scottish Bible College, early 1900s. He asked this question of his students. He said, why is it so hard for the godly to believe that God also loves the ungodly? And the answer is really simple. Much like Jonah, we misunderstand grace. I think we get it intellectually. I think we get it theologically. Practically, I think it challenges us. It challenges me. I want you to think about the kind of attitude we often have for those who don't know Jesus. How some people we tend to look down on. Others we tend to think maybe they're beyond God's grace. That's Jonah in us. Or how often unbelievers show more concern for us than we show for them or more concern for people who are broken and hurting than we do. That's Jonah in us. Or how often we tend to look at our own church or denomination as having cornered the market on doctrine and truth. That's Jonah in us. Or how we see ourselves as insiders and everybody else as outsiders. That's Jonah in us. We should see all these things as red flags in our lives and our hearts that's saying something not right. When these things rise up in us, they should remind us afresh that you and I were once lost. But God was intentional in coming after us, pursuing us with his persistent grace and saving us. And they should all be beacons drawing us to the cross as the only place where we can come in repentance and faith and find forgiveness and grace. God is able to use even our mistakes, our failures, and our bad attitudes to bring the loss to himself because he is intentional about that. But he would prefer us coming joyfully, gladly, persistently, Those two policemen threw me up against the wall of the church that night. And they didn't take into account I was only 13. I was a big kid for 13. They started peppering me with questions. What's your name, boy? Who's your mom and dad? Where do you live? What are you doing here? Are you the one that's been throwing eggs? Who was with you? Well, given the fact I had dropped an egg on my shoe... And it was pretty much busted there. I had to confess. They threw me in the back of the squad car, and the two of them stood out there and talked for what seemed like days. I'm thinking, they're getting ready to take me downtown. I'm going to go to the jail. That's what's going to happen. Finally, they got in the car, and we started driving. I'm back there crying. I'm back there whining. I'm back there thinking... What am I going to tell my daddy? He's going to kill me. Instead of going to the police station, they drove up my street. Now, we lived in a little town. Everybody knew everybody else in this town. They knew my daddy. They drove me home up my driveway with the blue lights on in the car. (laughs) Marched me out of the car, up to the front door, knocked on the door, told my mom and daddy what had happened. And y'all, the storm just started blowing. I mean, the storm got really bad at that point. I didn't rat on my friends. I took the whole thing myself. It became a hurricane in my life. 
Now, the police let me off with a warning, but not without serious consequences. First, I had to go to every car we hit with eggs, and I had to apologize to the family. I had to wash and wax their cars. It was a bunch of cars. (laughs) Then I had to go clean about two dozen worth of busted eggs off the street in front of the church, which was really hard. (laughs) It was a really embarrassing time. It was a really hard time. I was grounded for like a year. (laughs) Hard as it was, though, God used that event to humble me and teach me something about mercy and about thanksgiving. And sadly, he'd have to teach me the same lesson again and again and again all through my young life until I finally got it. And he finally changed my heart. God doesn't waste anything, y'all. Not a storm that comes through your life does God waste, even if you bring it in yourself. God has blessed us for one reason, that in humility and faith we would love him and love those around us. And every one of his people play a crucial but distinctive role in this. Nothing else, y'all, is going to bring God glory, nor will it satisfy us. And God is committed to both of those things. But to do that, he's intentional in making himself known, changing his people, and reaching the lost. And that intentionality is a key part of his persistent grace. Here's your assignment, my assignment this week. What kind of storm are you facing in your life today that has God's intentional hand in the midst of it? Maybe a little storm, maybe a big storm. It may be through a relationship or an illness. It may be through some loss of someone or something. It may be a problem in your job. It may be because we're aging or some other struggle. You need to know We can't press through these things too quickly because in the midst of storms, God is trying to make himself known. He's working to change us, and he is trying to equip us and get us a people quick to go with the good news on our hearts and on our lips. As we come to the table this morning, and then as we leave to go out into the world, let's ask him to make himself clear. What are you doing, Lord, in these things? Because we dare not ignore him lest we miss the blessing and the opportunity to be a blessing that he has in mind for us. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for Jonah's story. Jonah is a challenging book. It challenges us at every level to look at our own faith and our own lives to see if they're consistent. And when they're not, you call us to repentance and faith. Oh, Lord, we often don't get it any better than Jonah does, but we praise you and we thank you that you are persistent in your grace and you are intentional in the things you're doing, making yourself known, changing us, and reaching the lost. Help us to embrace these things by faith. Work in our hearts in that place, in those places where we desperately need your spirit. That we might give you glory and love you well and love those around us well. Oh Lord, we want to please you with the way we live. But we need your grace and we need your spirit. Come Lord Jesus, come. We ask these things in your strong name. Amen.